Welcome to the Endless Knot Podcast. Where the more we know, the more we want to find out. Tracing serendipitous connections through our lives and across disciplines. Hi, I'm Avon. And I'm Mark. And today we're talking about Egypt and Rome and Egypt in Rome. <laughs> today we have an interview with Bet Hux. Before we start, one new patron to thank. Thank you, Corey, for joining us. Woohoo! So we'll get right to the interview. Bethany Bet Hux is a PhD student at Heidelberg University's Center for Advanced Transcultural Studies at the Institute for Near Eastern Archaeology and the Institute for Egyptology. Her thesis is on the Egyptian and Egyptian style art, hieroglyphic inscriptions, jewelry, and architectural elements collected for public and private use in Rome during the 2nd to 3rd century CE. And she also works with 3D modeling of buildings and architectural objects. She is an advocate for increasing access for marginalized students in ancient Mediterranean studies and archaeological excavations. So let's get straight to our interview with Bet. So hi, Bet. Thanks so much for being with us. Thanks for having me. So we will start off with our traditional first question, which is, are there some unexpected or surprising connections between what you study and other aspects of your life or other places on the path to what you're doing now that were perhaps surprising connections between different areas? Sure. I am an American studying the role of ancient Egyptian presence in ancient Rome. As such, I am someone who is also wandering around Italy, thinking about how long it takes to sort of lose your place of origin, how long it takes to assimilate into the place where you live, what evidence will be left behind once I go, and how that relates to the people I study in the ancient world. So that's been something unexpected that has come up just sort of recently as I'm thinking about what my next steps are after I finish my doctorate. Well, that's really interesting. So a parallel that you didn't expect to be there when you started this line of inquiry. Exactly. Thinking about being far from home, away from community, living in a second or third language. Um, you know, are there other people like you around? And, right. you know, I'm, I'm also Black American, so there's even smaller communities that I'm missing out on here as much as, you know, you can find other Americans, which is not really what I do when I'm around here. I do spend most of my time with Italians, but, you know, thinking about, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not going to have a family here, but thinking about if I wanted a family here, what that would mean for my kids and their kids and mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Oh, that's really interesting. So, okay. So can you expand then on that area of study and maybe a little bit about why you're in Italy to do it as well? Sure. So I came to Italy in 2017, I want to say now. No, 2015, almost six years now, to do my master's degree in museum. Part of the reason I chose this program is because it's a joint American-Italian program, so I get my diploma in both places, and I don't have to sort of qualify myself if I choose to work either in the States or in Europe afterward, which is really helpful. Right. But also because I knew that I wanted a PhD and my language skills were not advanced enough and I couldn't find a program based in the States that would get me to where I needed to be to do a PhD with enough languages to start one. So I came here and through my work here, I got interested in Emperor Hadrian and his collection, his enormous collection of Egyptian and Egyptian inspired objects at his palace at Tivoli. A lot of them are now at the Vatican. They've become quite famous now, Vatican or the Capital and Museums. But essentially thinking about how these objects are displayed separately from the sort of greco roman pieces that were originally in the same spaces. So if you go to a museum now, they have the Egyptian section, which includes all the things made in Egyptian style, but not made in Egypt itself. And then they have the greco roman sections, like the Hall of the Muses, all these white marble statues, etc. When originally they would have dis been displayed in confrontation and comparison with each other. So I was thinking about how important it is to look at them as entire assemblages in general. So that's for my PhD, I'm looking at not just Hadrian's Villa, but a couple of other sites, and I'm reconstructing them using a database primarily in order to analyze them statistically by point of origin, materiality, et cetera. And then I'm creating uh, digital 3D models 
so that people can walk through visually the spaces. And what I'd like to do is print those 3D models um, and make the plans available for printing for people who want to use those models in schools or museums, et cetera, so people can play around with them. So people who uh, can't see the actual, like on a screen, can't see, can touch them and uh, experience the same, you know, move, move the pieces around, see how they would have been able to be uh, in, in conversation with each other. Mm. That's really cool. Okay, so uh, this is something I don't know a lot about at all as somebody who doesn't work in this in either material culture or in, I hesitate to call Hadrian later antiquity. <laughs> I will get in real <laughs> trouble for saying that. <laughs> but I, I work in, it in, you know, an earlier period even than that. Hadrian's always associated, it's in as much as I know much about him, as collecting, um, you know, as Hellenistic, Hellenizing, right? That's the most famous thing about him though also as just generally a traveler. Can you tell us more about the Egyptian material that is in his collection and, and you know, where and why, as much as we know about it, why it was there? Sure. So Hadrian made two trips to Egypt, many years apart, as part of his sort of attempt to integrate the Roman Empire and to emphasize his dominance, especially after the Jewish revolt in Egypt the second time. That means that he had the opportunity to take a lot of stuff back if he wanted. Instead, based on the work out of my master's thesis, what he seems to have done is to create a lot of things in Egyptian style. He's taken some things from Egypt, yes. And of course, we don't have anything that would have been made of like wood or more easily transportable because those things are the first things to get stolen or damaged or destroyed. Uh, nothing right. made of linen survives because it's basically a swamp. So we don't know whether he took back fabrics or, or things like that that are more ephemeral. But as far as the larger, the stone pieces that remain, only a few of them come from Egypt. And quite a lot of them are later, you know, made during Hadrian's time period out of sometimes Egyptian material, but often Italian marble hmm. made using Egyptian stylistic elements, but not using Egyptian craftsmen and integrating those styles together with Greco-Roman styles to create an you know, a sort of third form. And this had been done before by other people, notably the Ptolemaic dynasty in Egypt itself, which he would have had a large amount of exposure to during his trips there. But we know that he either purchased an obelisk in Egypt, blank, and then had it inscribed in Italy, or purchased an obelisk, had it inscribed in Egypt, and then shipped over to Italy. And that still stands, although not in its original location. So he did take a few things, but he largely created this whole series of pieces that he felt fit into his planning scheme. He's known for being super involved and in design and the architecture of his imperial palace at Tivoli. He's, he's created a couple of different new architectural forms by combining things that he sees in his travels in unusual ways. So he does the same with these kinds of objects. It's interesting. We, you know, typically think of imperialist, not only kind of the taking of the artifacts, but, but also oh. the, the appropriating of the, the sort of culture. And we think of that in terms of like Britain and other European countries during the colonial period. But it's interesting that there is a, a sort of ancient world parallel to that. You know, Rome is was the, you know, biggest empire and they too borrowed and <laughs> literally took artifacts. This is pretty common across the ancient Mediterranean throughout this time period, but it goes back, you know, almost at least six, seven hundred years at this point. We're talking, you know, second century CE by the time I'm discussing the, this process is already entrenched in Roman history, but it doesn't start with Rome and it doesn't start with the Ptolemies. There are stories across West Asia talking about these sort of, after you conquer a city, what you, what do you do? You take the statues of their gods back to your home capital and you display them for your citizens in a way to say that their gods weren't strong enough, ours are stronger, we rule them. And then the people who see those objects back in the home countries who might not have any sort of context as to how they would have looked or uh, what they would have been used for in their original spaces, look at that and get inspired and make their own pieces in reference to it using the sort of 
common artistic tropes that they're used to seeing in their own world. And this is really common. I mean, it just makes sense, right? You see something new and shiny, you like it, but you don't necessarily know how to do it the way they do it. Or you might prefer your own cultural background to have more influence on it. Mm -hmm. Or that just might be like the kind of art that you're used to making. So you integrate it into a way that makes sense and is visually pleasing to you yourself. And if it catches on, you know, then it becomes this whole third form art form. Yeah. And, and there's particularly famous examples, I suppose, with people like Alexander and then those who followed him of this sort of taking the gods, but also also a straightforward aesthetic. Hey, look at all. Let's find all the cool stuff everywhere <laughs> and, mm-hmm. and bring it home and make it part of my stuff, because one of the prerogatives of conquering somewhere is to get the cool stuff. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you hear a lot about it from like modern art historians and Mm -hmm. there's quite a lot of like, I think there's quite a lot in popular culture that implies that this sort of thing starts with Napoleon, but he's following a long tradition at this point. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the very obvious sort of locus classicus for Rome is Syracuse, the conquest, Mm -hmm. uh, not that it won't have happened before, but that's the one where we sort of, where the Romans themselves sort of saw it as really starting as when they sacked Syracuse and brought all the Greek stuff back home. And as we know from the Roman moralists, everything went downhill from then on. (laughs) (laughs) And the funny thing is, like, it's not quite the same as a triumph, like a parade, a triumphal Mm -hmm. parade where you sort of demonstrate all of the people you enslaved and all the plants you took back and all the statues you got, you know, sort of that kind of triumphal parade but when you roll an obelisk from the port at ostia to rome on rollers Mm -hmm. through the streets i mean you make a big impact and it takes so long and you can only do it during certain seasons where the road gets too swampy and so you can only do it during like colder seasons this is a huge process and then to raise an obelisk it takes a ton of people Uh, a lot of engineering skills. It's incredibly difficult to do and very heavy that we have ancient drawings of how they performed this labor. And it's, it becomes its own form of parade. Not to mention a lot of the people who work in the shops nearby get really angry because you block the streets for their actual customers. Then they wind up doing these sort of (laughs) things where they like sort of pay people off or give them like holidays to celebrate the movement of the obelisk, which becomes its own social phenomena, just because people get so mad about how many columns you're like, through the streets on a regular basis. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, we think quite a lot about, you know, we hear in various contexts of the Romans of of, of how you know, essentially the, the big engineering stuff they did while pragmatic sometimes was also in its own way simply a demonstration of power. Like if you can put that much resources towards something, if you can do that much work. So not just that they brought the obelisk from Egypt, but that they could manage an obelisk at all, as you say, is is a, a way of demonstrating a certain kind of dominance. I also think it's really important to remember that this is a way to give people jobs. Like right. you're regularly employing a huge number of people. So you're displaying power, but you're also like making sure that there's less civil unrest because people have labor, which gives them food. Um, right. And gives them somewhere to go every day because these are people, some of them are highly skilled. Some of them sort of, let's say, untrained labor, but wind up sort of rope pulling or whatever. But it becomes a regular enough thing. Then that's you are now a construction worker, essentially. You're trained in this and you can go do it other places or for other people. Right. Yeah. And I think that's an underappreciated that's a good point because that's an underappreciated part of the circuses of the bread and circuses, you know, idea, which is, it's not just the entertainment itself, which keeps people happy, but the entire industry around the entertainment. And if you expand the entertainment or circuses there to artistic and cultural elements beyond just, you know, the actual circus. Plus um, plus the bread and, part and, is like how many yeah. people are buying, making bread? How many people are employed mm-hmm. in the bakeries? I mean, there's a ton of labor that goes into yeah. everything that happens in the Roman Empire. Yeah. That I think is understudied. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, we had a speaking of bread, we we have spoken with Josh Nudell and he was talking about, you know, how much that everybody talks about bread all the time as a basic staple and people do not spend nearly enough time thinking about who made it, how they did it, where they did it, you know, how those mechanics happened because of these things, they're invisible, right. In so many of our sources, mm-hmm. but Shout they're out to Josh. really important. Yeah. I'm also thinking about like, so there are a lot of jobs that people 
don't spend a lot of time thinking about. So I'm, I'm working on some research for an article that I'm writing about how you get Nile crocodiles to Rome for the games. <laughs> they're not exactly docile cows that will like hang out quietly on the ship so just like thinking about all the people whose jobs it is because at this time it takes about three weeks based on the winds and the currents to get from from italian certain italian ports to alexandria and egypt but it takes about three months going the other direction hugging the coast all the way north and then west mm-hmm. to get back so how do you keep a crocodile alive and happy without killing enough people that there, there are people willing to still transport them and then like get them from Ostia to Rome for the games? Yeah, and 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 you know that you can't just bring the little crocodiles because that's not going to fly in the no. Coliseum. So <laughs> no, because yeah, it takes they grow at a rate terrifying of terrifying ones. Yeah, yeah, they grow at a rate about um, a third of a meter a year. So mm-hmm. like if you're feeding them well. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> and the Nile crocodiles are generally <laughs> fed well. <laughs> yes, you want to keep them fed well. But also, like if they're upset, they they go off their feed, just like any other right. animal. So uh, okay. you have to keep them happy. You try to not sail during storms, because I don't know if they get seasick, but they're not going to be happy being thrown around very much. Um, and, and they don't get, exactly like, building... you have to keep them hydrated. You gotta yeah, I was going to say, they water. don't exactly have tanks like, uh, exactly. like we might be able to now, right? There's no SeaWorld tank. <laughs> and there's no tranquilizer. I mean, maybe there were other ancient ways of keeping them sort of, tra- like, the equivalent oh, of tranquilized. I would uh, like to imagine people, the person whose job it was to pour wine down the, the gullet of a... <laughs> well, I was thinking you would drug the meat, right? Like, that would make the yeah. most sense, is, yeah. like, putting yeah. some sort of powder or whatever onto like the opium meat. opium or something in there, them. yeah. Yeah. yeah, but we know from like modern crocodilians that like if you ever hear stories of alligator hunting in the Americas, crocodiles are very persnickety about which meats they prefer. Um, and they prefer their own sourced, like they prefer nutria to chicken, for example. Right. So like now you got to bring a whole bunch of other animals because it's not like they're <laughs> going to cure meat to feed crocodiles for three months. Or you've got to stop in a lot of ports which adds right. to your time to acquire fresh meat on the regular basis. So like, who are the butchers? Just, just it's a whole lot of like random little connections mm-hmm. that I'm, it's more of a thought experience experiment because there's so little actual documentation, but it's right. a really fun one right. that I'm working through. Yeah. And this is the kind of thing you don't want to do practical archeology span for. <laughs> <laughs> Experimental like archaeology, sorry. <laughs> a, oh, I think yeah, the ethics gosh. board might not allow you to do it. <laughs> Just a little bit. And B, I prefer, you know, personally to not have been chomped on by a croc as like a yeah. fun archaeology yeah. story. Yeah, like there's a you reason know. there's very little underwater archaeology in the Nile and it's largely hippos and crocs that prevent it. <laughs> yeah, the the you know, preferentially keeping all your limbs. Like you know, one manages with what one manages, but really. <laughs> <laughs> it would make a great story at conferences, but I'd rather not. Yes, indeed. Yeah, the crocodile is so interesting because, I mean, it's so iconically the the symbol of Egypt, as we know from things like the, the coins, coins, and, coins and stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And to anyone who'd, who'd been to and, you know, visited Egypt, it was presumably a very, it wasn't hard to see or hard to find them because from all the stories, they seemed to have been very common, but, but actually seeing them in Rome. And so, so if you want to bring a symbol of Egypt to Rome, that's the obvious symbol. And yet. (laughs) (laughs) There are some mosaics and things that demonstrate that people clearly have not seen crocodiles or are not good artists when they reproduce them. And then there are some that are like, oh, this person definitely saw one. Like this person (laughs) knows what they're talking about, which I find a really interesting juxtaposition. But yeah, there we have stories of a particular tribe of people in Egypt that were training now a breed of crocodile that is now extinct in Egypt, but continues to exist in Western Africa. And Mm -hmm. these crocodiles are purportedly more docile and were actually trainable. So this particular group of people used to perform acrobatic tricks with the crocodiles and used to breed them for use in temples, etc. So I would be interested if we were ever able to find you know, sort of larger numbers of crocodile remains in Rome, which is pretty unlikely. Mm. Again, bones get destroyed because it's a swamp and it gets built over and there's just like very little left. Yeah. So find, but if you but find finding, the right midden somewhere, maybe. <laughs> finding some way to identify what, which type 
uh, whether it was a traditional Nile crocodile or this what's it, I don't know, West African crocodile would be really interesting to me. Mm hmm. Yeah. And I'm just trying to imagine what performing crocodiles. <laughs> well, there's a, there's a very like. famous I'm having a Peter of, Pan moment. <laughs> there's, of, there's a very famous statue of one of these of the of the person is on the back of the crocodile, like basically on its neck, doing a handstand. Um, oh yeah, 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 I yeah. So that. it's, yeah. Um, I mean, yes, stay behind the mouth. That seems like a very good beginner <laughs> strategy. But like, I can't imagine the first person to be like, you know what, I'm gonna do. <laughs> yeah, you, you know, after, after that's a little bit boring. I think I know what I'm going to do to try to pass the time. <laughs> like life was not dangerous enough at this point. Like everything could kill you, and yet you're like, you know what? I need more risk, more risk in my life. Yeah, yeah. That it, one thinks of when you talk about the representations, the all those nylot nylotic scenes. I guess they're called right the mm -hmm. the art the paintings, wall paintings of scenes of the Nile. That started and also mosaics, long before yeah, this period. Yeah. And mosaics, yeah. Started long before it. So Hadrian is not by any means the the first Roman, obviously, to be interested in Egypt. It's a long standing fascination. Do you look at all at the sort of earlier or other connections between Egypt and Rome in that context? Or do you focus yes, on the Yes, So Hadrianic it's really period? it's really interesting what kinds of objects survive from the sort of earliest parts of Egyptian artistic influence in the Roman Peninsula, which is around the first century or, you know, around 150 BCE, you start getting like some smaller objects. And then around 50 BCE, you get like a large influx. And then right. of course you get the sort of suppression of Egyptian cults, like the cult of Isis, et cetera, mm -hmm. because they bring political implications that the empire does not want. And then after the conquering of Egypt, there's sort of this mass wave, obviously, as the trade level and contact level increases dramatically um, mm -hmm. between people going back and forth to take especially grain, beer, et cetera, from Egypt to Rome. And then, you know, sort of people going, uh, soldiers and administrative officials, et cetera, going to Egypt living there and then sometimes coming back. So there's a lot of, there's this sort of huge boom at the time I'm talking about, this sort of passion for things that look. There's obviously a big divide between what people who don't earn any money can acquire and mm -hmm. what people who basically own the empire can acquire. <laughs> but we see these sort of like really, really cheap replicas of clay lamps that have a lot of Egyptian motifs on them, like oil lamps. Tons and tons of them have survived. So we know that there must, must have been even more that didn't. And again, things that are made of linen or wood, destructible things wouldn't have survived. And those are most likely to be owned by poorer people who can't afford granite or gemstone mm -hmm. or anything like that. But yeah, there's a, a lot of jewelry, personal jewelry, rings, earrings, and uh, that sort of thing, cameos that have Egyptian motifs on them. People are buying and spending with sort of coins or collecting them as commemorations of the conquest of Egypt, etc. So there's a, I mean, it starts to become pervasive across Rome and Ostia and the surroundings there, Benevento. And even as far as Florence, there, uh, just outside of Florence in Fiesole, there's a cult center to, that has a statue of Isis, a statue of Mithras, etc. And then you get things that spread through the Roman Empire. So you get dedications to Isis in London, in Germany, mm -hmm. in Paris. So it goes all over the place very quickly. You know, it's funny when we look back at different periods, especially at prehistoric and you know, Put that in words and quotes, but anyway, periods, evidence. There's always this sort of complicated question of when you see goods that are from one region in another region, does that imply trade? Does it imply movement of people? You know, how is it taken, and what kind of cultural contacts are you are you seeing? And sometimes, depending on the period, people really do take them as okay. If you see, you know, stuff that's made in one place ends up in another place, that means people from this place ended up in that other place. But then, when we look at Rome, because we know so much of the historical context of the relation between Egypt and Rome, we know that often it's importation of things, not people. But to what extent? Do we know anything about how much, you know, were there craftspeople being imported as well? Were there workers or like, you know, how much of the 
Egyptian material or pseudo Egyptian, or that's not quite the right word, but Egyptian influenced material is coming from Egypt is being created by Roman or Italian craftspeople. Are they importing the Egyptian craftspeople? Are there actually Egyptian people coming to live in Rome and surrounding areas who are bringing their own material? Like, is this tourist material or or settler material? <laughs> like, is there any kind of evidence about that? Because I can imagine there might not be. So there's there's a lot of circumstantial evidence that people use to say there must have been Egyptians in Rome. There is not very much textual evidence, which people tend to take more seriously than archaeological evidence for a variety of reasons. Longer story there. But in my opinion, in my opinion, you have to look at the two things together. For example, mm -hmm. when we're talking about the priests and priestesses of Isis at the temple in Rome, mm -hmm. they were known for speaking late Egyptian. Late Egyptian is an incredibly complex language. Um, not even that many people in Egypt would have learned it at this point, except for priests and priestesses. So it's highly unlikely that someone Roman learned it and then right. came back, you know, in the span of a couple of years. It's much more likely that someone from the priestly classes in Egypt came to Rome. And on the flip side of that, based on some of the ways that some of the sort of hieroglyphic inscriptions are done, it looks more like someone did them after arriving in Rome than someone who was used to doing them in Egypt. Stylistically, they appear similar, but the grammar differences are notable in a couple of cases. There's, there's a little obelisk here in Florence that is clearly not made in Egypt because it's made of black granite. The obelisk is meant to indicate the rays of the sun god reaching out to his people on earth. So it's mm -hmm. done in red or pink granite. Doing it in black granite totally destroys any sort of original <laughs> Egyptian meaning or context to it. But it's interesting right. because the top third of the hieroglyphics that's surrounded on all four sides makes sense. And then the bottom two thirds like either the person who was in charge of it died or left the project, or maybe they had a transcript and it got wet or destroyed or whatever. But what they start doing is putting random real hieroglyphic symbols, but in an order that makes zero sense. So, um, <laughs> so it, it moves from communicative so like to trying to, to decorative. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's a really interesting case study in terms of like what is happening. Now it's hard to tell how old that obelisk is, but that's sort of indicative of what's happening on the Italian peninsula. It's like people are trying in some cases to be as genuine as possible, but not understanding the original purpose or function of objects, or they're making them work for them in completely new and different ways. So they'll take, mm -hmm. you know, hieroglyphics that don't mean anything and put it onto objects that appear original Egyptian, like canopic jars, et cetera, that are used in the ceremonies religious ceremonies in Rome. So there are quite a lot of these objects that have sort of double lives. They had lives in Egypt and then they were brought over and they're modified in some really interesting way. But what that means to me is that either there are so few Egyptian people involved in these religious practices, or they've been there so long that they've also have lost that sort of visual connection, that sort of knowledge, linguistic knowledge, et cetera, as they're participating in these things. Yeah. So there's the, like, there's a lot of Basically, the answer is always is it's complicated, which is like not really a good answer. But we don't have yeah. at this point, a lot of Egyptians have been writing in Greek and Latin, especially Greek or variations yeah. of it, Demotic, et cetera, for 300 years. So mm -hmm. when they come over here and they're writing in Greek and Latin, how can we even tell unless they have right. Egyptian names? But they also have Greek names. Some of them have multiple mm -hmm. names for different contexts, et cetera. So it's it's mm -hmm. one of those things I don't know that we'll ever know the answer to. Yeah, because the cultural context of Egypt, especially Alexandria, is already a super, super complicated place before Rome even gets its hands on it. So yeah, yeah I mean, my favorite Alexandria story in re regard to your question about like who's making these objects is right. that there's a, a Greek colony just outside of Alexandria, and those people start making fake shwabti, those little statues that are found in Egyptian tombs that are meant to be your servants in the afterlife. Um, mm -hmm. 
And we know they're all mass produced out of this one place because there's a transcription error where they mess up the hieroglyphics in one specific place. And then they keep making that error over and over and over and over and over <laughs> again. And they export these Schwabtis to like all over Greece. And they're really popular in Greek context, but they're not used as funerary objects. They're kind of like like travel trophies or display to be like, oh, look, right. I'm so cultured. I don't know. People are using them in, in completely different ways than they would have been used in Egypt where they wouldn't have really been displayed publicly for people to look at. I mean, they serve a, f a function in the afterlife for the person. So, yeah, I just, I love that story of like the early <laughs> mass production of, of sort of tourists, collectible tourist items. Tourist paraphernalia, basically. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, a lot of these people didn't go to Egypt to get it. They just bought one off a trader. So it looks like right. you're more well-traveled than you are <laughs> or that you have connections <laughs> or whatever. It's it's just such a fascinating phenomenon to me. Now, you've mentioned ISIS a couple times in this discussion. I know that's another area that you're interested mm -hmm. in. Would you like to to expand on ISIS, <laughs> who is just a generally you? fascinating topic to everyone. Sure. So Isis is the primary goddess of the Egyptian pantheon. She forms a family group originally with Osiris and their son Harpocrates, well, with their son Horus. In a Greek and Ptolemaic and Roman Egyptian context, Osiris takes on this other aspect of a god called Serapis, which looks a lot more like Zeus and Jupiter stylistically, but wears an Egyptian headpiece. So it makes him sort of identifiable to both cultural groups. And then their okay. son, you know, he sort of takes on the, the more curvy form of, of Greek and Roman style carvings, it becomes more, more Greek and Roman appealing that way, but he maintains an Egyptian hairstyle. And then Isis can be Isis is so popular as a goddess because she can be what's called syncretized with so many other gods and goddesses. So mm -hmm. Isis becomes popular in large part because you can make her into the protectress of whatever thing you need her to be. So mm -hmm. in her aspect of Isis Fortuna, so she combines with the goddess Fortuna, she becomes the goddess of luck. There's a version of her which becomes Isis, who's the goddess of sailors. So she becomes the protector of motherhood, of farmers, of sailors, of children, of soldiers, basically all of the people who need protection. A protector. That's yeah. why she's so popular. And she's like her cult spreads like wildfire. So many people um, are worshiping Isis throughout the Roman Empire, even if she's not necessarily their primary goddess or whatever. There are so many little totems to Isis found all over the place. That there's certainly a market for protection at this point, mm -hmm. that people feel some sort of way about Isis that doesn't happen with many other gods or goddesses. And I think it really is that that thing that, you know, you can make her into whatever you want her to be. Right. Well, and she is given a personal interest in the lives of humans in a way that is not always true of Greco-Roman gods. I mean, they exactly. can be. Some, some of them are, but... Um, some of them are not. <laughs> so. Yes, and you do find cult sites that are, you know, in the Italian peninsula that are more dedicated to Osiris or Harpocrates, mm -hmm. etc., um, or even Anubis. But Isis is definitely more pervasive right. throughout. So the textual discussions of Isis are interesting, and I'm going to just go out on a limb and say not fully representative of what we find in the archaeological record. And that that's just based on, I don't know what we find in the archaeological record. I just take that assumption. Because the, the textual references in Rome to the cults of Isis are, at least the ones I know, are denigrating, generally, and either are about laws banning it, as you mentioned earlier, uh, and, and often lumping Isis in with Bacchus in terms of sort of two sets of religious practices that are not welcome in the city, that are, you know, invite foreigners and, and corrupt the youth. Always a concern of the Romans. Yes. <laughs> Their youth was amazingly corruptible. It's really, <laughs> but then also the other place that I'm most familiar with Isis is she turns up in Roman elegy a lot, in Roman poetry. Again, not usually as the focus of the poets worship but as their girlfriends and there's a, a definite class and gender thing going on there so can you talk a little bit more about how isis was viewed or worshipped in rome and or the, the, in italy sure so 
Obviously, there are early political problems with the cult of ISIS, especially in the Italian peninsula. So the cult gets banned and suppressed for a while, but there are still people worshiping ISIS to the point where in Pompeii, the first temple of ISIS was destroyed, I think in an earthquake, and then there was a fire and they kept rebuilding it. So they rebuilt it at least twice. That's how important she was to them. Even though you might have taken it as a sign from other gods that her temple kept getting destroyed. I mean, <laughs> yeah, but if Pompeii had taken like, that, <laughs> taken those particular notes from the gods, they <laughs> would have dealt this, with things. With a very different they, they got quite a few signs, to be fair. Yes. <laughs> they did not listen. <laughs> but then in Rome itself, for example, we have mm. all of this text written by men about how much mm. women love. Isis and her worship, you couldn't, you had to get initiated into the mysteries of Isis. And at the end of its life, this temple complex was enormous. So obviously there's a lot of money coming into it. There are a lot of objects that are brought from Egypt or using Egyptian stone, and that costs a fortune to transport. Granite is some of the heaviest material found in Rome. You usually have to get it worked in Egypt because the Italians were not great at sort of granite statuary and things like that. In comparison, they just have a very limited relative history and they're used to working with softer stones, quite a lot of marble, etc. So you get these really expensive objects. So there's obviously like a lot of higher class women mm -hmm. or higher class people heavily involved, but then you get all these like upper class men or soldiers or sailors, et cetera, who are complaining about the involvement of the women in there with this cult of ISIS, possibly because mm -hmm. they weren't initiated. So their wives couldn't talk about it with them. So it becomes right. this sort of like private thing that a lot of men can't sort of control when in fact, normally the paterfamilias is allowed to have every bit of control over every inch of his wives or daughters' lives. Mm -hmm. And especially the religious lives. I mean, yes. that's part of of where Roman unease about some of these kinds of religions comes from is that the paterfamilias is the religious center of the family in yes. theory. And anything that's outside of that is upsetting. Yeah. Yes. So we have some descriptions of people who describe their friends telling them, I got initiated into the cult of Isis. And that's mm -hmm. you know, male and female things that happen there. But we, mostly the complaints we get are from men saying, Either my wife joined the cult of ISIS and they have too much sex and I'm really uncomfortable with that, or <laughs> my wife joined the cult of ISIS and they have a day when they're not allowed to have sex and I'm really mad about it. So it's like there's a lot of <laughs> there's a lot of trash talking that is in conflict and basically it seems to me to be sort of misogyny based jealousy mm -hmm. around this because they're not complaining so much about their male friends being inducted but that like they're literally the some of these soldiers and sailors are writing formal letters of complaint asking the government to deal with the women involved in the cult of isis <laughs> right and and yeah there's this weird tension about how because i know that there's roman poetry love poetry too that also says like my girl barred me from her door saying <laughs> that it's because of ISIS, but I'm not sure about that. But if it is, damn it. And a poetry weird... that involves calling on ISIS as the protectress. So there is yes, like, yes. there's a little bit of, of like offsetting, but not enough to make, at least what's survived has not been yes. enough to make it balance. And I wonder how it would look different if we had more women writers preserved, yes. you know, are they, especially people who are looking from, both the inside and the outside. Do women feel the same way about other women's involvement in the cult of ISIS? Do women involved in the cult of ISIS, are they allowed to write or talk about their experiences? Or is it more like Fight Club where, you, you know, first rule is <laughs> can't, can't talk about the yeah. mysteries, but can, can you write about it for your private self? What are the rules? How far can you stretch the boundaries there? Mm -hmm. And one is, you know, another thing we're never going to know probably is how much does that worship of ISIS change when it leaves Egypt? What does it transform itself into? Because I'm, I'm sure it did change to some extent when it came to Italy, but, you know. We do say, have some they, really interesting yeah. columns from the Temple of ISIS. Three are in the Musei, Musei Capitolini in Rome, and one is in Florence in the Archaeological Museum. And they mm -hmm. show processions of uh, people at the Temple of Isis, carrying Egyptian and Roman objects in 
and modeling different dress and hairstyles that come from a mixture of both cultures. So you can mm. see that they're already, you know, at the early point here, integrating their practices together. But it's more than likely that there was still for at least several decades, a, a priest or priestess of Isis who came from Egypt to read these sort of magical spells in Egyptian, which might contribute to why people thought it was so mysterious. Because if even you as a, it's sort of like going to mass in Latin as a modern person who does not speak Latin. Like, you know, even it's the initiates holy, didn't know what was happening. And you yet. kind of have a, like an idea of what the priest is trying to get you to mm -hmm. do. And you know what you're meant to perform, but like, do you actually know what's happening? Do you know what's being mm -hmm. said over you? Probably not. Yeah. Yeah. And that's going to add to the suspicion because it's foreign. To the suspicion, but also to the desirability of it. It's yes. the sort yeah. of exoticism of, you know, there's, there's a power there that other people have that I want access to. And this is my way through to that. Right. Right. I mean, I guess I should mention, I, I don't know if it's something that you spend much time on, but the other, the most famous literary representation of Isis of, is, of course, that the Golden Ass story, which is all centers around, at least in theory, <laughs> the, <laughs> the worship of Isis. I mean, trying to explain what that novel, what that work is about is always a little bit complicated, oh, and maybe we won't get into that now. But he does but, relate um, the yeah. story of his friend being initiated into this cult of Isis mm -hmm. and how he's, he puts himself into the story as he's like walking around the temple. So you, mm -hmm. the temple is a public space in itself, but the inner sanctuary is protected by these heavy drapes. So you can't, if you're not initiated, you can't go into that inner sanctuary. And it's not like walled off. It is curtained off mm -hmm. in his description. So he can't see what's happening, but he can like kind of hear a little bit like sort of yeah, maybe muffled so like sounds tantalizing. Or whatever, maybe smell yeah. a little bit of the incense that's happening because there there's a lot of like you know mm -hmm. incense being burned as part of religious practices etc. So he is jealous that he can't participate, but not enough to join and find out what it's about, mm -hmm. which I always find really interesting. That he's mm -hmm. he sort of like feels like he should be permitted full knowledge without the induction ceremony, just from like mm -hmm. a curiosity perspective. Right. <laughs> and then the whole story of the the transformation, et cetera, has to do with sort of bringing him to the point where he's willing to be initiated, I guess. Mm -hmm. But also, it's I find that story really interesting from the uh, perspective of trying to do my 3D modeling, because we know oh, there yeah. were drapes, but he doesn't describe you know, sort of color, length, mm -hmm. detail of the fabric, et cetera. But we know that there were there was a lot of fabric involved in partitioning off these right. spaces. But because we don't have a standing structure, we don't know how they were hung up, what kind of stylistic things there would have been. Did they come from Egypt? What colors were they? Did they come from Rome mm. or elsewhere? You know, what kinds of spaces could have been created through the use of drapery? So that's something I'm working through using wall paintings of other spaces. Right, right. Because it's more than likely that they would have done so in a more Roman style than Egyptian style, given the fact that the temple itself is laid out using quite a lot of Roman elements. Right. Right. Well, and yeah, and, and if, if fabric was important in spaces to do with Isis in Egypt, then Hajin probably brought or incorporated fabric into his displays but how you would ever you know that's not something you're going to find preserved so mm -hmm. yeah that's an interesting interesting question because of course i like the idea of the 3d <laughs> representations <laughs> because it's really cool but also you. because you know it gets us back to that question which i know you've thought about a lot about museums and representations of ancient spaces and things so often we can because we only have what survives and there is an understandable reluctance to sort of make up the other stuff that went around, <laughs> this, you know, necessarily to say, like, mm -hmm. here's a possible, if you're going to actually build a museum room in in meat space and put, you know, then you, you're, you don't want to be, t people are reluctant to do completely hypothetical re recreations and reconstructions and make it seem like it was the real thing. And I get that. But it means that we have this image, you know, along with our white statues, which 
we've talked about elsewhere as being mm -hmm. um, a, a problem, but we also have an image of like Roman spaces as being all hard edges. Yes. All solid, you know, stone and concrete and tiles and mosaics and maybe a bit of wood because that's all that survives, but it doesn't make any sense that that would be true. But, but then trying to like imagine or portray what it might've been like when you're not sure, you know, people are tend to be conservative about that. But And it's easier to do for, in, in my estimation, based on like literary sources, because that's the literary and, and visual sources, it's easier to do with eating spaces because those are public spaces. Right. That, that's where right. other people come into your house and describe it. It is very unusual for people to describe their own spaces in Roman literature. Mm -hmm. They're commonly describing right. like their neighbors, either a really good dinner party or a really terrible dinner party. Um, <laughs> and yeah. you go to these public spaces, these few public spaces, and you go back home and you write about, but you mm -hmm. don't talk about, like nobody's ever going to check out your kitchen or yeah. nobody's writing about your bathroom. So there, and, and very few people are writing like about private spaces of course, most people who would have been permitted into the extremely private spaces would have been enslaved people who are cleaning yeah. or otherwise taking care of the spaces or artisans who go in there and then they leave with a static image of it because it's not like they're going back after they're done with their piece of work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so you don't have the representation of, of what it would be like. And then, as you say, you And all the use... furniture is gone. Yeah. All the cushions are gone. Anything made of wood yeah. that you would have sat on, anything made of wood with like sort of rope or, or straw lacing mm -hmm. to cushion your rear end. Like all of those things are gone. We have mm -hmm. examples of some of them, a few of them, but mostly what we have to work off of is either literary depictions or uh, these wall mm. frescoes. Yeah. Some of them are not from Rome. Some of them are from Pompeii because obviously those are the best preserved ones. Mm -hmm. But that's a frozen moment in time. And I'm talking about a period 75, 80, 90 years later. Like how much have how things much has changed? changed? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, ancient history isn't static. It's just that we tend to collapse whole centuries together because it's just easier because we don't have all the evidence that we have for say the, the 18th century or something. Yeah. Yeah. You end up having to say, well, we've, I've got evidence for this, 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 and this here's six things. They do cover 300 years, but we're going to have to say <laughs> this is one yeah. thing because that's all I got. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that is, that is, Oh, sorry. Oh no, I was just going to say that is like such a perennial problem in all these, you know, whenever you're teaching Roman history or any ancient history, you're always like, okay, I'm going to say up front that this <laughs> material is taken from a 500 year span. And when you think about that, we do that all the time in the ancient world. And when you think about imagining doing that, you know, in a period that we have as better documented and saying, mm -hmm. okay, I've taken material about what people ate from 1500 to, to, <laughs> to 2000. 2000. And, it's and you know, it, it's, <laughs> uh, we, we don't have great evidence. So I'm going to take like one thing from each century and say that that's, and then, then imagine that there was one dinner party that had all of those things <laughs> at it. Like, you know, just like even leaving even, aside the Colombian exchange, which completely throws that off. <laughs> gosh, even if you just threw, for instance, like what a parking garage with cars in it looks like yeah. over the last hundred years. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's just such like a something really different space. Yeah. Yeah. So we we do that. And yes, the pace of change was perhaps somewhat different in the ancient world, but it wasn't, it, it didn't stop changing. <laughs> so, right. so yeah. 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 So power dynamics are constantly shifting, but part of the joy of mm -hmm. doing the 3D models on the computer is that you can do things like change the seasons. So you can change the right. light around. You can easily like drag and drop objects. If I'm permitted, I don't know what the object rights are going to look like for this yet. But if I'm permitted right. to give people access to a version in which it's not just static, they can play around with it. Or, you know, the three models that we print, part of the joy for students is to decide what they would want that space to look like if you have nine muses and this certain number of Egyptian statues. Some of them are in black right. granite, some are in black marble, some of them are in red granite, some of them are in steatite and other, other different like variations of colors. Mm -hmm. 
they're not white. Some of them are white, but you know, with very striking, like the head of Demeter, that's of Isis Demeter that's in the Vatican. It's the size of, you know, a love seat, basically. It's just the head. <laughs> It's just the head, a white marble <laughs> head with this incredible headdress. Like, what do you do with that when the next statue over is this, you know, sort of life-size bust of, basically it's it's got the head of a bull on one side, the abbot's bull on one side, and the face of a man on another. Um, <laughs> they're joined, you know, back head, mm-hmm. head to head, like, like, like the Janus. Janus. Like a Janus. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, where do you put those? What do you want to do with them? <laughs> <laughs> what was the thematic center of this uh, <laughs> assemblage? Yeah, yeah. yeah well, like, uh, like, is Isis Demeter meant to look down on you? Because we don't have evidence because the walls crumbled of any sort of like right, niche or column put, yeah. that's big enough to support it. It's this huge piece. So, like, what do we do with the fact that we're obviously missing some major piece of information there? Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, no, I like that. That's what I mean by being able to do, like, to try out hypothet because once you've got this as a a 3D sort of setup or as a, a, a computer setup, you can try out the hypotheticals without committing a, you know, a, a museum space to saying, okay, we're going to put draperies in this whole room or we're going to do whatever, you know, those things are impractical and, and problematic, but being able to say, okay, well, let's try this hypothesis. Let's see what it would look like if this wall painting is a, an accurate representation of what it might've looked like or something like that. And I think that's yeah. just a, a really helpful set of, of, of possibilities. Yeah, I'm going to make the 3D printable schematic available so anybody with access to a 3D printer or a makerspace or a school mm. or whatever that has a 3D printer can print out, you know, the objects and the physical space really probably cool. without the roof because or I don't know how I'm going to do the roof thing, make it a separate piece so you can optionally put it on. Yeah, cuz obviously but, you want to be able to get in and move stuff around. Yeah. Yeah, and just to look around at it and whatever, but yeah, just like make it so that people can play around with it in their own space for very little cost. Cause I think that that's mm-hmm. one of the things I work a lot on, like trying to bring access to the ancient world to people who normally don't see themselves represented in classic studies, et cetera. And, you know, trying to bring archeology span to people who don't feel like they can f- physically or financially access spaces. So this is mm-hmm. one of the ways I'm trying to, I'm experimenting with, we'll see how it goes. Yeah, no, it's fascinating. Okay, well, maybe we should stop there on that note. And you know, maybe <laughs> sometime in the next year or two, uh, we can revisit that project when it, you know, has gone another step or two, and also talk more about those other interests that you have in terms of making the ancient world accessible. But we've kept you for a, a bunch of time now. And I know you have some Latin to learn. So <laughs> I want to leave oh, you some joy. space to go do that. <laughs> Hey, I would never want to stop anyone from spending some quality time with life. But this has been really fascinating. That's such an interesting area of of study, but also such a really fascinating way of approaching it and and trying to open it up. So I look forward to hearing what happens as you go on with this. Yeah. Thank you. I hope I can get it published soon enough that other people can make good use of it. Mm-hmm. I'm hoping to finish my PhD and submit, you know, in September. So Right. It'll be accessible as an idea for people to read through within the next right. year or two. That sounds great. Now, are there places that people can follow up and see more of your work or interest? Are there places you want to tell us about where they can access you? <laughs> sure. So I am available on Twitter. I'm very online. I don't, I don't understand yeah. that. How could... <laughs> <laughs> I met Ava and Mark online. For those of those listeners who are not familiar, that's how we <laughs> became acquainted. Um, yeah. <laughs> yes, so I'm at Roman Egyptiaka. That's A E G Y P T I A C A. Um, but you can look me up as Bet Hux on Twitter if you have trouble with the transcribing the spelling. Otherwise, I have a little bit of work on academia. Dot edu, including a chapter that I've written in Italian about the arrival of the first objects or the, the main body of objects from the collection at the Museo Egizio in Turin from Egypt mm-hmm. in the early 1900s and some other works in progress I've listed there. But yeah, basically I have a couple of things I'm hoping to get out in publication this year and, and next mm-hmm. year. So Yeah, you can follow me on either of those locations to keep updated. Perfect. And we will put links to that in the show notes, of course. Thank you.
Well, thank you very much for talking us to us today. Um, this was such an real... enjoyable conversation. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> On a rainy day here, it's nice yeah. to think about Egypt. <laughs> 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 Maybe less so the crocodiles, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I feel like when I want to escape, when I want to like think about how nice where I am is now, you can think about <laughs> humidity and crocodiles, and then maybe the rain seems a little more palatable. <laughs> fair point. Very fair point. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks again, and <laughs> enjoy your Latin. <laughs> Thank you. For more information on this podcast, check out our website, www.alliterative.net, where you can find links to the videos, blog posts, sources, and credits, and all our contact info. And please check out our Patreon, where you can pledge to support this show and our video project. You can go directly to the videos at youtube.com slash alliterative. Our email is on the website, but the easiest way to get in touch with us is Twitter. I'm at Avensara, A-V-E-N-S-A-R-A-H. And I'm at alliterative. To keep up with the podcast, subscribe on your favorite podcast app or to the feed on the website. And if you've enjoyed it, consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. It helps us a lot. We'll be back soon with more musings about the connections around us. Thanks for listening. Bye.